like olgabidashevashopteaks.com. Um, now just, I like to be interactive by show of hands. How many of you have visited Shop Teaks before? Okay, awesome. I can um, definitely say that I will soon be spending a lot of money on your website, so thank you. Um, but what I'm so excited to be here about is to introduce Olga and to have this conversation with her um, and all of you. Um, I've been incredibly impressed by Olga since the day that we met a couple weeks ago at her office. Um, very exciting and cool headquarters as well. Um, and Olga's the founder and CEO of ShopTeaks.com, which is an online destination where customers can shop the best boutiques from all around the world. It's really considered more of an open table of retail because ShopTeaks provides local businesses with access to see, uh, digital marketing tools so they can have competitive online presence as well. Um, she graduated from Wellesley College in 07 and went on to Harvard Business School in 2011 and then went on to be the first single founder, non-technical entrepreneur accepted to Y Combinator, which is a really incredible incubator out in Silicon Valley in early 2012. Um, later that year, and after raising about over $2 million in funding from investors like Greylock Partners, Andreessen Horowitz, SV Angel, Benchmark, William Morris Endeavor Agency, Olga went on to launch Shopteaks with 25 boutiques on her platform. The company recently passed 2,000 boutique benchmark and is quickly growing. Um, and prior to starting at Shopteaks, she worked at Goldman Sachs, Chanel, and modeled for fashion brands. So welcome, and very excited to be chatting with you thank today. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you guys for coming. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here. Great, so before we get started, I wanted to thank everyone who sent questions ahead of time. Um, we'll definitely be covering some of those as we're um, chatting today, but I encourage you to also ask these questions during our Q&A session after. Um, so let's start with the early days. Did you come from a family that was so focused on business and entrepreneurship, or what was it like to grow up? Um, it's really interesting because I, I, I'm from Kyrgyzstan. I moved to the States at 17. Um, I didn't speak any English when I got here. It was literally $100 in my pocket. And my mom was a musician. She lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and she still is a musician. Um, and it was amazing to come here and just feel like you could do anything. Um, but my family, being from Soviet Union, definitely were against any risk. Uh, so definitely wasn't from entrepreneurial family or, or family that encouraged risk in general. Uh, definitely from a family that encouraged education. Um, and that was probably the most important thing in my family is always study hard and, and then go, you know, definitely, there was no question about not graduating college, uh, but always encourage you to go even get more education. But there was no question when I when I uh, raised money, my grandma asked me if they're gonna go after me, and she's like, "Oh my God, this money you're raising!" And um, it was a very scary thing for my family. Um, but because I was uh, kind of Americanized along the way at Wellesley, I was able to look and see that there's so much opportunity to build a company. So, what did you want to be when you when you grow? I wanted to own a bank. <laughs> Well, but in all seriousness, my sister reminded me when I was 10 years old, all I wanted to do is to own a bank. Um, but I think I wanted to be, I went to undergrad for math and economics, so I wanted to do economics. I went to Goldman Sachs as a banker. Um, so probably more stable career on a career path before starting job teams. So you graduated from Harvard Business School in 2011, and one year later, Shop Teaks was born. Um, where did the idea come from? And you know, how did you really turn that process? What was the process of turning that into a reality for you? I actually feel like I uh, was meant to start shop boutiques my whole life, even though I didn't know it. But I loved boutique shopping. Every time I would travel, whether it was undergrad or, or you know, in grad school or at Goldman, I just would find local culture so fascinating. And uh, so, and I would find small boutiques, and they would carry something unique. I'd, would bring gifts to my grandma, either books, or I would bring to my family gifts like plates. I, I carried these plates from Bali uh, when I was there first many, many years ago because it was so cool and I was like, how can I not bring them back? And it had to be hand carried because they were just so fragile. Um, and it was crazy that they couldn't ship it to the US. Um, and then I would go to Paris and I would discover you know, beautiful clothing that they didn't have to be expensive, they were just unique, right? Stuff that I couldn't find back home. And I would come back to New York, uh, and all my friends would be like, oh my god, that's so cool, where did you get this? And a lot of it was happening when I was at Goldman, because I was working crazy hours, and I would travel for work, and I would like try to take a mental break. 
a mental break meant a little walk or a run down you know, local streets and you would find a cool store and it would be in a completely unexpected part of town, not even covered in you know, a guidebook. Um, and you would find something unique and I said, this cannot be true that so many of them have such unique product that women come over and over and buy and they have such a like, followings that, such loyal followings. Um, it's crazy that they're not online. And so when I did go to Harvard Business School, uh, I spent my whole second year just talking to 800 stores and saying consistently, why aren't you online? Because it wasn't for me like my life dream to start a business. It, for me, I wanted as a customer to have a website that would have beautiful products from local stores. That if I wear something, nobody else will have the same thing. You know, and I, I was really passionate about helping small businesses as well. Because we all started, this country started on entrepreneurship. Right, started, and what is small business? What, what is starting a boutique? It's the most amazing entrepreneurship that existed, existed for thousands of generations, right? And so um, I want to preserve that because that's how innovation starts and that's how uh, people create things. And I was really excited about that. That's great. So after business school, you were accepted to Y Combinator. Can you talk about what an incubator is, what that experience was like, and what it was like for you being there, non-technical, single founder, probably thrown in with a ton of other um, budding entrepreneurs as well? Yeah, um, so when I graduated HBS, this was, I guess we graduated in May or June, June 2011, and I had this great offer to go um, to a private equity firm, which was right up my alley, and I had so much debt because I paid for undergrad myself and then grad school myself. And so I was like, okay, what am I gonna do? And, and I just knew I had to start Shop Teeth because I just believed that this had to exist. Um, and so I was at a wedding in Jakarta, in the Indonesia, because my best friend from Wells was getting married and I was from Ada Warner, so I had to go. And while everybody's celebrating her wedding, I'm like talking to everybody about engineers. It's like, does anybody know engineers? I have to start this website, and I have no money, but I want engineers that clearly have to be cheap, because I have like a little bit of savings. So I found engineers during that wedding who built my first beta site. So by the time I applied to Y Combinator, and um, I already was like, I was 100% starting shop teaks. So whether I accept, was accepted or not, I, I was gonna do it. Um, and when I applied, two days before I applied, I actually launched the site. So we were in a really great position because I built this private beta. It was, you know, really hacky and I mean, I'm so glad that it actually like, I launched it because it was a good test. Um, and Women's Wear Daily covered us and we had a huge wait list of people trying to apply to join from the customer side. So I kind of saw that there's already demand. So by the time I got, and. And the reason I applied to Y Combinator, and so many of you that, that don't know what the program is, it's amazing, so you have to check it out. But I had no idea what they were, because my background was definitely Goldman Sachs and you know, not in business school, not tech. Um, and the guys that sat behind me in this co-working space, they were like, you're awesome, they're awesome, you have to apply. I was like, I have 20 minutes to apply because I'm launching the website, I'm not sleeping. There's like two months I have not slept. In this co-working space, I literally would stay there, like sleep a little because my engineers were in Indonesia. So I was working literally all day, every day for the signing boutiques and all night, all night is them launching the product. And so I was like, okay, I'll find 20 minutes to apply. And I feel lucky because if they didn't tell me, I would have never applied but it completely changed the trajectory of my business because the exposure that I was able to get to technology talent, to technology thinking, to the platform thinking, I, I just think it's unprecedented. And um, they're just really good people, exactly like my friend said. You're a good person, they're great people that you have to apply. Um, so these three months that I spent there, it was fascinating. Yeah, can you talk a little about what an incubator is and what that yeah. experience is like? Um, I mean, I think they're all different. So. Uh, you know, do obviously your research if you're considering applying to incubator. Um, Why Combinator is a three-month program. You may move to San Francisco. I essentially traveled back and forth because we started launching the business, so most of my either contacts were press or boutiques were already here, and I started hiring my team here because I knew I was going back. But you basically spent three months in San Francisco in, in Mountain View, outside of San Francisco, and. Um, you just work on your business. It's like an intense boot camp of working on your business and they get you the resources you need, primarily in uh, mentorship. So the type of people, one of my mentors was creator of Gmail, right, Paul, I was 
you know, fascinated. He could build Gmail and we all use it. And so the type of like, caliber of partners that you're able to get access um, is just incredible. And, and um, they're just really, the interests are really aligned with how they structure the investment in the business. So they just tell you the truth, whether you're doing well or not. And everybody there is just brilliant and working on their startups. So my year, I think we had 80 startups. And so an average startup has two people. I was the only single founder, non-technical, that they funded. But there were a couple of single founders who were technical. But in general, people have two or three co-founders. There's a lot of people are just working intensely on their startup. And it was really, really fun. And you work all the time. But just the intellectual stimulation is just awesome. And then by the end of the incubator, usually, there's a demo day where all of the investors come in and you present your idea to all of them. So it's a great way to raise funding because in one room, all the investors are in one room and you just back to back to back to back present your idea. And because you do that, and the investors are there to invest, the, the likelihood of investment is much quicker and much better. We were lucky because we raised before the demo day. And so during demo day, we presented and I left to back to New York to start building the business. Um, but definitely recommend my company. I mean, I, they've been family. I mean, I literally count them as family. It's crazy um, to be going back and forth and starting a business and at the incubator. Now, did you ever have moments where you just felt like you're in completely over your head? I feel like that all the time. <laughs> um, no, I think that, listen, the way I think about it, if you're not pushing yourself, if you're just like kind of, you know, cruising, life would be boring. So I feel like I, if, as soon as I start feeling like I'm comfortable, I push myself to feel like I'm over my head. So I think it's, that's what keeps the world go around. So you're now at over 2,000 boutiques mm -hmm. from 25 in three years. Like, do you sleep now? How did you do that? My team. I have the most amazing team. I mean, you're in my office. I um, feel so, so fortunate every single day to come to work and work with the most amazing, kind, smart people who work nonstop all day, every day, and who love what they do and inspire me every day to be better and smarter and um, more hardworking, you know, and so, uh, you know, together we're like an unstoppable force because we all know where we're going together. So this is something we didn't talk before. Could you talk a little about the culture of your company and like what it's like to work at Shopkeeks? We're super intense, so it's a lot of really hard work, um, and I think the expectation is for you just to be excellent. There is no mediocrity, um, and. It's kind of like work really hard, but play very hard. Like we watched movies last night together and drank, you know. But so there's a lot of fun events, and we do a lot of fun things. But the culture is like you respect each other just because everybody is incredibly smart, and there is no kind of place for mediocrity. But you always have to push yourself to be better. So one of our principles is always question the status quo, because the way I used to do it when we started, I mean, I'm one person. I want all of my team to be innovating every single day. And the company, that's why every three months we're like a fully different company, because we're constantly innovating in every single process. And so that desire to change, I think that's what differentiates us the most. We just want to be different and we want to be better every single day. Um, and some other principles is like do less, do more with less. So we're really, really scrappy. We turn profitable really early in our business. Uh, because I wanted to be in charge of my own destiny. Uh, we dream big. We want this company to go public. We are really focused on building a huge business, and uh, we want to, you know, really level the playing field for small businesses to be on the same playing field as Bloomingdale's and Macy's and, and big retailers. Um, and customer always comes first. I mean, that's the number one principle for us. We, I think, we all think of, as a user, all day every day, we put customers' hats on and say, why would the customer buy here? Um, but we are all really, it's a family, you know, I can't um, say anything else. I mean, they're literally my family and I, when I travel, I can't wait to go back. Um, when I, I was in Vegas last week uh, for a conference and I couldn't wait to see everybody on Monday, you know, and I never want to lose that. It's incredible. And so what's it like now, you know, you're, the crux of what you do is bringing boutiques online. So you're right at the center of turning this garment industry and clothing purchasing process that is pretty archaic at this point into something that's fueled by technology. Like, what has that been like? like? What's the education piece to it? What's it like working with these businesses that are just learning what, what it means to go online? 
you know, when we started four years ago, when I would call the stores, I would go to the stores, I would say, like, oh, I don't believe in the internet. <laughs> and they were so convinced. I was like, no, no, I think it's coming. <laughs> it will be, be important if you're alive. Uh, but now it's much easier. I think everybody's bought in into the idea that it's going to be a significant piece of retail, and people will be comfortable buying online. The way I see it is, I feel incredibly lucky that I work every day with retailers and with boutiques that care about what they do. So it's finding a way to work with uh, with retailers who are very passionate and often emotional about what they do. But that's what makes them so good <coughs> at picking out the inventory or creating inventory that women want. Um, and so it just finding a way and, uh, and figuring it out. But the nobody says we don't believe in the internet anymore. So that's good. Good for business. So where do you see the business going in the next couple of years? International. And so at the core of what we are, we expanded to Paris really early on. The first year we were already global, if you will. But um, that's because what is Shaptique's? It's ability to jet set to Bali and you know get plates from Morocco and pick up that sunglasses from LA and bikini from Miami. And so we're going to build more and more, we're going to find more and more stores, help them uh, better and better at exactly what they need. And you know, every day we talk to our boutiques and we want to make their life better and, and build tools that they need. And we want to provide more and more part of their, um, kind of help them with more and more of their life cycle, even in store. Can we utilize things that we are learning online and help them maybe with buying and things like that? So, what are, what's some advice you give to a budding entrepreneur? What's some advice you have given? Yeah, I think the number one thing that um, I would say to really anybody um, in the world, whether entrepreneur or not, but primarily entrepreneurs, do not start a business until you literally can put your life on it and say, this is like for me, and I'm willing to work 24 seven, and I believe in it so much, and there's nothing that can stop me. I read somewhere that Pandora founders got 200 no's before they got funded. So you know, if you got 200 no's and you still kept going, that's why it exists, is because they were convinced that it had to exist. Uh, I had so many hard things along the way too, and you know, I always knew that it just had to exist, and it was so clear in my mind. Um, and you just have to believe because there is like so much crazy stuff that comes with entrepreneurship and starting a business that unless you're very passionate about it, I uh, really don't think you can survive that. That's why so many companies fail early on, right? Because that's like like what I'm doing now is um, you know a lot of it is not as tough as mentally as it was when you're just starting out. You do every single job there. And before we open up to questions, I guess my la I'll, the last question I'll ask is, is there anything you wish you knew, you knew specifically when you were starting ShopTeaks? How hard hiring people is. <laughs> uh, you know, it's uh, fascinating because I feel very fortunate. Um, I come from a very hardworking family. Um, and uh, I worked at Goldman where people were super hardworking. I went to all girls school at the Wellesley who were like, here's what you need to do to get an A. People did that. So everybody was just like working incredibly hard. And so I, I got out of um, you know, Goldman and started a business. Didn't realize, I like expected everybody to have the same motivation as me. That yeah, <laughs> really wasn't the case. Um, and so it took a little bit of time to learn that how to hire people. I mean, I, don't, I definitely didn't have that skill uh, starting out and seeing, and really learning a lot about myself, what's important to me, you know? And so uh, that I would say, I wish somebody told me just how important and how to hire well um, and what to look for. And by the way, for each person in this room, it's different things. So I think it starts from you figuring out who you are and what's important to you, and then um, you know just kind of hiring people that will fit well. At HBS, I did this really cool project um, for this super hard class that was supposedly not popular because there was too much work, but I was like, of course I'm going to take that. And so it was an HR class. And we had to interview something like 15 to 20 really uh, big CEOs or chairmen or founders. And uh, we had to figure out whether they hire for people with the same skill set as them or uh, a skill set that was um, completely the opposite of what they were good at. And they were split. 
you know, so to me it was, it's literally a preference and you need to figure out the kind of person that, that you can work with. And then another thing I learned is um, you get hired for what you've done, but you get fired for who you are. So, you know, it's, um, it's really important to think about can you get along with a person day to day. And I have an airport test that I do, which is, can I get stuck with this person in the airport and, and survive the whole day? <laughs> yeah. You learn about yourself. That's important to me. Great. Um, so we'd love to open this up to questions. Any? Yes. Olga, I'm glad to know more about the living model. Do you want to talk about it? Can you uh, tell us about the living model? I'm just not clear how does it work. Uh, do you provide do you provide a platform for your boutiques, or you actually have an inventory? In, I just yeah, we don't own any inventory. So the way it works is, uh, once you get set up on the site, you have to actually be selected to to uh, join because um, we do a lot of support, and I'll tell you what it is we do. But um, we spend a lot of time, so you have to be selected to reject over 80 percent of the stores that apply to be featured on the site, and then we have pre-selected lists that we have a big sales team that goes after and then calls them. Um, so if you are selected, then uh, we set up, we can help you with your website, so build your whole new website. Uh, but the main model is you join Shoptiques and you have an e-store, which is essentially a page within Shoptiques that you list all of your inventory. And we'll help you with photography, we give you packaging materials, we cover all the processing fees, all the shipping. So when an order is placed, we send you a label and you just ship it out in our packaging straight to the customer. So we don't touch the inventory, but we do cover a lot of costs right up front from photography to right at the, at the transaction level when the product is shipped, we pay for shipping. And then help, help you with returns. And then we take a commission on every single sale. Congratulations on your success. Um, I'm curious how you set goals for yourself. Um, by the way, success is a is a really interesting word because it's still so much to do. So I don't I don't consider us even yet remotely successful. Well, I take that back. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. And um, in terms of goals for myself, well, I kind of know where we want to be um, to go public. You know, and I. My goal and background, I build a whole model to figure out what we need to do every single year. Um, I just want to work really hard and love what I do and, and work with amazing people. But I revisit, so I, I really believe in KPIs for the team. So I have different teams, and then you figure out what you want to achieve. And I believe in maybe having one to two metrics so the whole team gets behind. And then each one of them has their own metrics. Um, and then you align every single team to kind of pull force in the same direction. Um, and then for myself, we just have to the team hit those top benchmarks that we set out to do. Um, and then personal goals are having an amazing you know, team and culture and continue with that. Uh, but it's a different company every year. Like this company, Shoptix was a completely different company three months ago. In the leadership, in, in terms of structure, and so you know, evolving, and it's primarily because we just hired, we were 15 people last year, we have 55 now. So the structures and processes just break all the time when you, as you scale bigger and bigger, uh, which to me is fascinating. Figuring it out all again every time is so fun. Um, but the, the main goal is I, I want to build a huge business, and I think that's an advice that I also would give is be very honest with yourself what kind of business you want to build, because building a lifestyle business it's very different than building a business that investors can finance. And if there's misalignment of goals, it will be very difficult during board meetings. So we, I wanted to build a big business, and um, you know, my investors wanted to build, build a big business, and we are very aligned <coughs> on how we're going to get there. Why is it so important to you to go public? I think it would be fun. It's <laughs> totally personal. There is like, question. <coughs> uh, the question was, why is it important to me to go public? Um, I think literally, I mean, I worked at Goldman, so I took com some companies public, and um, the way I think about it, it could happen to a person once in a lifetime, and um, the probability of me finding another company that has a huge market that can afford to have that big of a market share and uh, market influence is very small, um, and I also think that it would be fun, you know, the whole process, the roadshow. Uh, building a business where like your family can buy shares in your in your business, um, and I also think that 
because we support small businesses, like every single person should be able to buy a piece of share of a small business movement and entrepreneurship in America. To me, like what gets me excited every single day is hopefully in one little percent chance I'm helping small businesses, that's super cool because again, this country and this innovation and it was built on amazing men and women who were building pizza shops and boutiques and spas and they were going in and creating and creating jobs and employing people and, uh, and working really, really hard. They're everything. They're from, you know, uh, buyer to like cleaning toilets to hiring people to doing all the analytics. And so it, it gets me very excited that we're doing a little part in continuing to support that. So that's really just Thank you. Nancy. Um, well, can you tell us what percentage of the uh, boutique owners that you work with are women, number one? Number two, do you see, is there a commonality of, of sort of mistakes that you see the boutique owners making? I mean, you mentioned before, oh, the internet, that's not important, obviously, that's a different story right now. But do you see that there are specific uh, commonalities in some of their challenges? Absolutely. So majority are women. Um, I would probably, I mean, I, I don't have the data, but I would say 98% probably women. I would say they, there's three types of stores. One, they're taking it very seriously and they want to make a big business and they're really successful because they listen to what we tell them to do. Because we have so much data at this point, we can help you a lot. Starting from ship out your orders within the first two hours of it placed, you know, and, and people who don't do that uh, are not going to see a high repeat rate. And that makes sense in the age of Amazon, right? Um, and then there's, so there's really, really professional people that are, um, they just have high goals they're willing to reorder or create more product as we tell them that you know this one exhausted and as they see signs and they really into data. Then there is um, the bottom layer, which is they don't really they don't take internet seriously, but they still want to be online even just for their own customers. So um, you know you want to accommodate every, every layer, and then there's a whole middle kind of class of people that. Um, you know, they they understand that it's serious, but they don't want to put as much work. So I think that in the internet, it's really as much work as you put into it, right? If you have two products listed on ShopTix, you will never do a million dollar in sales because there's two products on the site. It's the same thing as like having a store with two products inside. Nobody's going to buy those because they want to see choice. And so educating stores as we go along and, and uh, understanding their ambition as well, because I think it's all about aligning and um, in their expectation and understanding what they want to achieve. You know, because there's some stores that got overwhelmed by how much orders they had. All right, so I have to actually like, control on both ends. Like some people don't want to have that much business because they do want to go home to their kids, you know, a certain amount of hours and, and they don't want to have to ship that many orders. I'm sorry, to follow up to that. I know that you're, uh going global so that you've got boutiques now all over the world and what kind of challenges does that present for you? In other words, if I was someone in the U.S. and I ordered something from a little boutique in Paris, you know, are there customs, are there regulations? How do you overcome some of those challenges? Well, I think that's like the biggest value that boutiques honestly take advantage they, that should join shop boutiques for is we take care of all the logistics. So. When the customer purchases, all the duties and taxes are already included, everything is handled, you get your package three days later, Seem feels so like seamless to you as a customer, and so seamless to you as a boutique, because we send you a DHL pickup, somebody comes in, picks up your package, all you did is you package it in. But for us, oh my god, and I love logistics, but this is crazy, dealing with everything from VAT to duties and experts. Um, we also have a lot of like cool products that are, you know, nobody knows what to do with it. We just had to register as like wildlife American, like we have a number in wildlife. I'm like, why do we have a number? Yeah, um, it's because if you're like exporting or importing like some special materials or leather, you have to like report, report to Wildlife Foundation in America or something. I was like, oh my God, we, deal, we do so much. So, um, but it's really exciting. I, I mean, I have an amazing woman who runs our international business. We launched in, we launched in France really early on our first year. We launched in Canada and the UK last year. And um, we are launching five new countries this year. So we're really excited. And when you think about launching, do you launch by product category? Or is it mostly by boutique and whatever they have to offer? 
Well, we limit the categories. So we're clothing, um, shoes, bags, accessories, and home decor. Um, so a boutique can curate in those categories any way they want. Uh, but we, we now know how many stores each country needs to have to kind of make a sustainable marketplace. And so when we go into it, we say, okay, we want to have 50 or 100 stores. And, and here's how we're going to tackle it. And here's the stores we want to go after. Um, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what kind of stores would make marketplace stronger, right? Because, you know, if I'm expanding to, um, I don't know, anywhere, like when we did UK, we wanted to have really unique UK brands that nobody here can access to anywhere else in America. And so we're very strategic about what else we want to do. And what is those local places known for? Our Canada business is doing amazing, you know, UK business is doing amazing. And so being very strategic and thoughtful about the um, product mix, but not limiting them because they're, they're creators, you know, they're the reason we exist. At the Y Combinator, out of the 80 startups that were there, how many got funding and how many still exist today? I really don't have those statistics at all. I, I'm, probably, I'm sure that if you email them, they would give it to you because I think there are articles about it a lot. Um, you know, I have amazing mentors. Reddit came out of Y Combinator, Dropbox came out of Y Combinator, Airbnb. And you know what's amazing? The network is so strong. I just emailed uh, somebody from Air the founders of Airbnb, and they responded to me. So it's it's awesome. It just yeah, it's really strong. Do you already find yourself being a mentor to to people? Because it seems like your generation of people is is just full of entrepreneurial spirit. Are you on boards, or how are you already having an influence? I mean, um, you know, I'm here. I hopefully help, can help somebody in a small little way uh, to be better and, and to hopefully start a business or be better in their business. Um, so that's my way to give back. I work all the time. So I try to mentor women in my office. So I try to take three lunches a week that I take different women, different ages, um, and try to help them with their career and how they think about it. Um, you know, and try to mentor my sister, <laughs> who loves me, which is nice. Um, but not as, as, you know, I don't sit on boards or, or do things like that. Yeah. I think that to do it well, it takes a lot of time. And I think it's a disservice to the individual if you do it halfway. Um, but there are certain people in my life that I try to help them. We actually, even my peers, that we help each other in, uh, in just brainstorming ideas and in a small business. Stuff. And in those businesses that you respect, are there any businesses that stand out for you as inspirational, where you aspire to go? I mean, Airbnb or you know Uber or things like that. What are the businesses? Airbnb you is a really big inspiration for us, and it's very similar to us um, in many ways. And uh, I inspire Open Table. What they've done for restaurants is very, very amazing, um, and it's a very similar business to us as well. So I definitely look at those two companies. I love what Seamless have done, um, Grubhub now. Um, so definitely a lot of amazing businesses, but you know I inspire to my um, bosses at Goldman because they love what they do and they're still there. Um, I just inspire to people who pursue their passions and do 100 percent, you know, every single day. Thank you. What's your relationship in terms of the stores and on the B two B side that you mentioned buying and merchandising and things like that? Is there So we don't do the vendor side. Uh, the boutique has to come in with, we will give them templates to reach out to vendors and say, you know, give me photos or whatever. But we don't kind of control that vendor relationship. They have full authority to pick on their own what the merchandise they're going to pick and what they're going to list. We give them some analytics, right? The, the black pants online don't sell because people love to try black pants and they want to know how they're going to fit. Um, and so we will give them analytics and data to hopefully help them with decisions, but they're the creators. We want to be their online presence. We help them with websites, we help them with email marketing. So we do a lot of tools for them to be successful online, but at the end of the day, it's their creativity that got us there. And so respecting it and, and not limiting that business side is really important for us. It sounds like you made some uh, initial investment and ongoing investment for support for this store. So what, what do you do with those that don't give you your return on investment? Do you cut them out or do you wait until they actually get the money, your money back? 
We haven't actually got anybody out. Uh, the question is, um, you support a lot of the stores, and what about stores that never gave you money back, essentially, in, in your um, investment originally into them? We um, haven't dropped anybody. You know, I, I can't tell that whether we would or we would not. The, the, you know, the time will tell, because if we're still in your business, you're going to celebrate our fourth year anniversary, which I can't believe that it's been four years, but it's still a small, like a new business. Um, and as we scale, we will know what makes sense and what doesn't. As of right now, we treat our stores equally, because I think we've been so selective in the stores that we bring in, and we still very passionately believe that every single one can get to that aspiration um, of, of having a lot. But our business is like a volume business, so a lot of people need to do by a little bit. And that's how we grow, so we never want to have power boutiques. Because then, if you have power boutiques, then all of your little guys are not going to be that strong and not going to get as much exposure. So we want to keep it you know, much more fair and good for them as well. Um, so you had mentioned that one of your interests is um, offering the little guys, the small businesses, like competitiveness against big retailers. Um, how do you plan on continuing to gain that competitiveness? Like, like Nordstrom Rack's Hope Look, do you plan on launching an app or like commercials? Do you have like a game plan to like keep it going? Well, first of all, please all pull out your iPhones and download our app. You do have an app? Awesome. Okay, okay. You do have an app. Android. I can see it on my, on my drawer. Yeah. Yeah. And though, you know, we're actually a special company for Google, so we talk to them a lot. And we love Google, because that's great. <laughs> uh, but we will one day launch Android. But no, Android internationally has to happen. In America, majority of Android users are men. I don't know if that's statistically right, but for us, um, so we've started with iPhone, so please download, rate, um, okay, so now that I've done this, I spill. Um, so the way we think about it is we have amazing stores and we sign new stores every single day. So if we are great partners for our stores, they're promoting their store every single day and they have foot traffic and those women coming in and then going home, they're going to shop online. So if they go to that source website, they're going to end up on ShopTeeks. Mm. And so we really focus on the store relations. We obviously really focus on our customers as well. Um, but I think what boutiques can offer that nobody in the world can offer is that personal touch. You know, I think only as a, as a humanity, I think we are looking for those experiences. We want to um, have relationships with other humans and, be, and belong somewhere. And uh, when I get, you know, purchases from ShopTeeks, myself, and I buy a lot, obviously, um, and they write you a personal note, and they're like, I really hope you love the skirt, and you should pair it with the sweater. It's special. It touches you in so many ways, and you just want to go back and buy more. Um, and then the feeling of supporting small business. So there's nothing that, you know, that's our core, that's why we started, and the goal for us is not to try to figure out billboards, although we did a campaign in New York. But it's much more about figuring out that whole process yeah. and how to make it much more um, visible to the customer and educate our consumers on why they should be buying from small retailers. Our tagline was, um, all the stuff you can't find on a site that runs with Blumazon. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about that? That was actually one of the questions that came through prior to the event. Um, how did you go about building that first audience? And what is that process like now when you expand internationally? So. We rely very, very heavily on our boutiques for all the acquisition of the users because individually the boutiques are um, small. But if the, when they if they go together, that's a network. That's why it's a network perfect marketplace, right? So educating them how much stronger they can be if they work together to acquire the audience, um, and then utilizing their offline audiences online. That's really how we scale. We focus on SEO. We have a lot of organic traffic. We're really lucky on the press. Um, you know, email is a really strong avenue for us, and people love getting our emails. It's cool new store in New Orleans, and you know, um, so it's it's just fun. Um, and when we launch international, people love it because it's like, oh, go shop in London. Yes, please. <laughs> you know, Paris. It's just fun. Um, but again. The core of what ShopTeeks is, is that experience of getting the package and feeling like, oh my god, somebody packaged it to me with love, um, is what makes our customers come back. And when they come back, it means we don't have to acquire those users again because they keep coming back. 
So when you're selecting boutiques for your site, do you have a target customer in mind? Do you like know who your average customer is, what she likes, who she is, you know, income, things like that? Do you think iTunes have an uh, average customer? I guess not. Yeah, we don't have one because we have over 2,000 stores and every single store has a very particular woman that they buy for. So we're a platform, so we don't need to. Oh, Netflix, right? We all can go in. Every single person in the audience can go in and find a movie there that they love. And so what we focus a lot on is the technology. And that's why my company was so important is because if you come to the site, we wouldn't have much for you, but we would have gifts for you. So please um, shop gifts. Um, but every woman, when they come in, we start learning more about them, especially if they have been a boutique shopper, so we know their information from our boutiques. And we start serving them things that we think they're gonna love based on the data that we have. And that's really important because um, we don't have a target woman. It's you know it's everybody. We have customers who are 15, we have customers who are 80 plus. Um, and then it's, it's our job. It's not a boutique's job. Boutiques are doing their job. They're buying the most amazing product, you know. And, and think about it. What fascinates me about boutiques is, you know, in big retailers, not from their buyers, and they get paid salary, and maybe they have a bonus if they do well. This boutique are putting their livelihood online by buying the product that they really believe you, your customer, is going to come in and love, right? So the stakes are much higher. So the product that we have is just much more curated because the focus is on literally putting, okay, this is my money and that's all I have and I'm going to go and buy the product that I, I really believe I'm going to sell, otherwise they're not going to take a risk. And so it makes it for a very fun business. Just can you clarify one thing? Um, I've not been on your site yet, I'm really excited now to get, get on it. But does that mean once you have a relationship with this shop, that if somebody just walks into their store, you still get a commission? Um, we don't. We encourage us, our customers to go into the store. Okay. Um, because to us, you know, if small businesses exist offline, that's fantastic. That means they're going to be in business longer and they'll be successful online. Um, a lot of transactions are cross-border, just because you know, if you live in New York, it's exciting to buy from Paris and London. You know, if you live in Kansas, it's exciting to buy in New York. But people also do pick up in store. We offer it as pick up in store and we encourage them to go in and buy. <coughs> So many women face challenges in their professional career because there are women and it's still a male dominant world. Do you have, I want to hear like your views or tips or experiences that you had being a woman, a successful woman? Um, to be honest, I always work with guys like I was a goldman and I there was like five women on my floor. I just believe you just have to be excellent and that excellence, that's all that people are looking for. When I you know, interview people or when I hire people, I don't care if they're a man or woman or whatever. I just want them to be the smartest person, qualified for that position. And I think that's, you know, everybody I've ever met are like that. So I don't want us as women use that as an excuse. Do I think there are sometimes prejudices people have? Absolutely, who cares, brush it off and move on. Because if you're excellent every single day and you wake up in the morning and you know you do your best, that's all you can do is your best. There's nothing else more you can do out of yourself, right? And so pursue what you want to do and don't even pay attention to all the noise. Because you have to have a goal, make a plan, stick with it, and then go execute on it. And nothing else really matters. Any other questions? I'm not sure how we are on time. Okay. So thank you so much for sitting with me and chatting with everyone today. Um, and thanks for everyone for coming. Thank you so much for having me.